presenter for this afternoon is Mondo Romandaza Augustine Kandemwa. He's a spirit medium and medicine man from Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. In Shona, his native tongue, he is known as Mohondoro, as I've been, you know, using the term. Uh, Skiviro and Gombwa, all those names he's known by in his native tongue. He was initiated through the tradition of the Njuzu, the water spirits. As a vessel of the spirits, Mandaza receives visions and dreams, makes offerings, performs healing rituals, and serves as a messenger for the ancient ones. Mandaza carries with him in his heart the Central African spiritual tradition of healing and peacemaking. He is known internationally for his loving presence and for his preservation of the old ways. He stands for truth, love, justice, and peace in this world. Uh, Mandaza was raised in a Christian home, trained as an educator, school administrator, and police officer in apartheid Rhodesia, which is currently known as Zimbabwe. During this time, he became actively involved in the liberation struggle. Like the water spirits he carries, Mandaza flows between the worlds. He easily moves between the worlds of Christianity, the secular, the traditional, the modern, the industrial, and the earthways, all that is sacred and profane. Currently, Mandaza travels internationally offering teachings and healing counsel in churches, schools, prisons, and hospitals. He co-authored with Michael Ortiz Hill, twin from another tribe, and The Village of the Water Spirits, two of the few books that, dis that discuss Shona cosmology and traditional practices. Mandaza serves a large community in Zimbabwe that is dependent on him for food, clothing, education, healing, and spiritual nourishment. Mandaza is married to the Ndebele trans medium Simakutlen Dube and has 12 children, 10 boys and two girls. Um, at this point, I would like to call upon him to give us his presentation that would really focus a lot more on his practice as has been enunciated and he would be also relying on telling some personal stories around what he does. Over to you, Mohondor. Thank you. <laughs> In traditional healing and peacemaking, using the eyes of traditional healing and peacemaking, I see that there are no hierarchies here, no VIPs when I look through the eyes of Ubuntu, peacemaking and healing, as is required by spirit of oneness. That great spirit we have given several and many names, some of the names we can not even pronounce. God, Creator, Mari, Musikavanu, Jah, and all that stuff. But when I look through the eye of truth and love and justice, I see that we need healing, humanity needs healing. Never mind, my dear friends, that I'm going to follow what is on this thing here. I'm following what I'm receiving right now. Ubuntu is a subject that is being well talked about universally. It is a subject that is being investigated by many people. Just like any history or like any word, one of them being the Lord's Prayer, for example. People have studied the Lord's Prayer. 
they have memorized it so well, including the little kids. The question is, humanity, do we understand the Lord's Prayer? Do we truly understand the Ubuntu concept with the ears of our hearts? If you ask anyone of you to say, how much have you learned about Ubuntu, all about healing and peacemaking? We have different visions of healing and peacemaking, different visions. What is healing? What is peacemaking? When we talk of the dialogue with the Dalai Lama, <laughs> what are we talking about? Our elder, Desmond Tutu, people were shaking hands with him this day, and uh, it was beautiful. When I was looking at people shaking the hand of our elder, I was looking at the true essence and the meaning of the word Ubuntu. When you become Ubuntu, you attract. Even flies and butterflies will come to you. Do we have that kind of Ubuntu in us right now? After many speakers had presented about the Ubuntu concept, years and years, they are doing a lot of research work in the universities and high schools. <laughs> Have we become like our elder who attracts? He sits there quietly and he attracts. Those are the beautiful fruits of Ubuntu. <laughs> We humans are too good at talking and teaching, preaching about world peace. People are... <laughs> Don't make it too long. We want to pray for world peace. How can we pray for world peace? How can we heal this wounded Mother Earth, human society, when there is war and conflict up here? in our minds. And I want to say, share a little bit here. Power of language. Okay. Power of language. Indigenous knowledge and wisdom. If we analyze what in knowledge we have acquired a lot of knowledge in this world. A lot of stuff is packed in here. Is this knowledge bringing healing? Is it bringing Ubuntu at all to the world? You answer that question for yourselves. Next slide. Here is Mandaza. Mandaza, that's my name, given to me by my ancestors through my parents. Mandaza means born of water and shall return to water. This is the Mandaza you see in that slide there. I did not like to be what you see in the picture. I resisted because I was born and raised Christian. I resisted for 15 good years. But my resistance never paid any dividends. I never won this war. I had to let go of my resistance. So to become who I am today. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ubuntu. So you see, my dear friends, spirit medium, vessel of, when you are a spirit medium, you allow whatever 
sacred power to use this body. To use this body, whatever I say to people, whatever I say to anything, any organization, has to come from my spirits. And I receive those messages and I share the messages with the world. So being a vessel of spirit, they trained me to become a medicine man. I can dream of medicines, plant medicines. I see them in my sleeping dreams, my, my visions, daytime, nighttime, and I go out in nature and bring the medicines, and I'm shown how to use them. So I am a powerful dreamer. Yes. I'm then a custodian of that wisdom, that information, that knowledge. It has been passed on from generation to generation up to my generation today. If I were to go today, this information, the work I'm doing will be passed on again from me to another child in our family. It's, it's unwritten history. It's oral history. So it is coming very alive after colonization. Healing practices when I look at people, there are two kinds of illnesses that we need to heal. The two illnesses are physical and spiritual. Humanity has a lot of challenges, a lot of illnesses that needs healing because the challenges are giving us Conflicts, separation, wanting to control, wanting to own everything. Like when these guys were presenting this morning, I was watching and I said, yes, this is a beautiful combination of people. But there are other brothers and sisters of us who work so tireless, tirelessly to take good care of us. Mother Nature, where are the trees in this conference? Where are the birds in this conference? Where are the wild animals in this conference? Where are the waters of the world in this conference? We are all represented, black people, white people, different religion, different cultures, that's beautiful. But we don't work like this in isolation. We have other brothers and sisters up there in the universe. In future, I was going to recommend, say, such conference like this one be held in nature, where we can include everything. <laughs> everything is involved. One thing I have noticed through my slide here is that it is only the old people, you and me here, who want to learn more about what we are learning today about. Where is the young generation? Who are the future leaders of this world? Where are they? Why did we leave them out? That's a big mistake we are making. My spirits then say, heal those wounds. Some little guys are born wisdom keepers. And when we exclude them, it's, it's not going to help us at all. Very soon, we won't live on earth for, for a long time. Here, the next slide, you see that when I was born, a sign to confirm that I was chosen to be a spirit medium by spirit themselves. It is said by my parents, when I was born, three, five days I was born, I became sick, I could not breath feed. I could not even cry. So they did not know what to do with me. They could not take me to the hospitals at that time. There were no hospitals in my village. It is said 
a stranger came through our village with a message, a woman who came to our village and says, there is a child born here who is not feeling well. May I have the child? My parents handed me over to this woman. She ordered my parents to follow after her. She went into the forest and asked my parents to create a little shelter with the branches and grasses from the woods. That one you see there in the photo there. I've been keeping that for years now. That is where after five days being detained in there, I was not allowed to be given medication at all. The woman said, keep this man here, this child here, for five days. She disappeared. In five days' time, I started crying and I started feeding. A sign my parents knew that there was something special that was in my, my life. Next slide. During the time of my resistance, I was visited by spirit in my dreams and my visions. <coughs> I would see at night time birds in the skies there descending from the skies coming towards me. And they'll turn into human beings. Started telling me that Mandaza, thank you for surrendering, for letting go of your resistance. We are the ones. We want to give you some work of healing and peacemaking in the world. First, I doubted them. They kept on coming. Finally, they even came daytime where I would take a nap. I would see the elephants surrounding me. I would see the lions around me licking my body. And they were saying, you are the one who have chosen to do this work. Hence, all what I know about healing uh, as a medicine man, as a spiritual person, spiritual medium person, have all come from these ancestors I am talking about, who come to me in many different forms. So I don't do things out of nothing, out of nowhere. I receive messages. Next slide. Here. <laughs> I love this one here. the relationship between all creations, human to human, human and nature, human and creator, we call Musika Vanu, Musiki, Tiko. How is our relationship with one another? If we truly want to bring healing and peace making to the world, how is our relationship first with yourself? We are pointing fingers at so and so for causing conflict in the world. Political leaders, business people who are accusing of corruption and everything else like the president was talking about. All those causes of conflicts are here. This is where we should pay attention when we talk of healing and peacemaking, when we talk of Ubuntu, the value and concepts of powerful Ubuntu. Let us put this in order before we become an ocean that refuses no river. Once you become an ocean that refuses no river, then let's begin to talk about bringing world peace and healing. If there is still conflict in the Middle East here, in Sierra Leone here, in the United States here, in Zimbabwe here, a lot of conflict going on. We are wasting very important time. Put this thing in order. 
get rid of the boundaries that are here. He healed those bleeding wounds in here. First, how can spirit send you to go and heal the world when you are heavily bleeding in here? We, we cannot achieve peace. We cannot achieve healing at all. Forget. So we have some homework to go and do at home. You cannot do this kind of homework as a group. You begin from this center first. It has taken humanity a long, long time. It's a long, long journey for human beings to travel from here to here. We are listening with the eye, with the ears of this head. We are seeing with the eyes of the head. We are not yet listening with the ears of the heart. Ubuntu, healing, peacemaking. People are following after Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu is only a messenger who has done it so well, so beautifully, that he expects to see the fruits of his seeds germinating from us all. He should be seeing the beauty of the work that he has done for years. Credo Mutwa is the same story. Still going to Credo Mutwa shows that we are not learning anything from him. Visiting this man it shows that we are not yet learning anything from him for years, all his life. He should enjoy the fruits of his work through us. <laughs> are you a fruit that is edible? Are you an altar, a temple that is usable by spirit today? Can the spirit claim that you are the temple of the Holy One? Can the Dalai Lama come and enter this new temple in you and find a space to worship, to do his prayers. Because you are the ground, you are the, the temple of the great spirit that wants us to have Ubuntu. Once you have the Ubuntu, you have the healing, and you have the compassion, the will to become one people, one world, one love, we sing this song of one love and celebrate in style. Are we ready to become that beautiful song? One world, one people, one everything. Are we ready to do that? We need to go and do a lot of homework on that point there. Anything next, man? Community building. This is the the work I do. I work very closely with the spirit first, with the community, and with my environment, nature. I bring all those elements together to make it into a strong, livable, and usable community. Remember, you are that community if you include in your prayers and rituals, animals and birds, the earth, the waters of the world, if you include them in your prayer, you become a community. For now, as it is, when I look at you, look at human society, I see a big piece of a jigsaw puzzle whose parts are scattered everywhere. They will ma never make an object <laughs> that will admire we need to bring these pieces together. How do we do it? We have physically today demonstrated it. Look behind you. Isn't this beautiful? But if you look at how we live in society, in the cities, you find there is a, the rich class, community up in the mountains, <laughs> the rich people living by the ocean, they are even buying some parts of the, the beaches because they want to own and control them. They are theirs. They are not yet ours. So that's an illness that needs 
all you healers and peacemakers. Because you are all healers and peacemakers here. No one can deny this. Some people say, I don't use plant medicines, I'm not a healer. When you say, let's make friendship here, you are healing, that's your medicine of approaching someone to bring them to you. Use that medicine effectively and it will bring order to our wounded world today. If I were to ask you how many people have you approached to make friends with who live in Soweto? <laughs> there is a story in Soweto in South Africa. How many people have you made friends with who live in Soweto? You make friends with those people of your class. <laughs> it's very interesting. <coughs> you fly first class, second class, economic class. But remember, this plane is taking off from the same airport and is going to land at the same airport. Is it necessary for us to be classified like that? It's human mentality, it's human illness that needs peacemaking. <laughs> <coughs> Next slide, Mama. Here, I was talking about the absence of young generation here at this conference. <laughs> when these kids finally become violent in life, <laughs> we blame them for having broken the law. Whose law is that? Look at the environment our children are being born and raised. In a, an environment where there is a lot of alcohol, abuse of alcohol, abuse of <laughs> the drugs. Look at the kind of, I'm trying to describe the kind of an environment that gives birth to violence through our children. Look at the toys that we buy our children today. Look at the movies that are so popular today. By the way, I'm talking about healing and peacemaking here. Okay, I'm not talking about the eyes that are painful in you or stomach problems. I'm talking about healing and peacemaking here. Are we healing the kids when we raise them in an environment that promotes corruption. I remember I was asked in Washington, D.C., United States, by this journalist, they said, ah, our children are very violent. They are no longer respectful of their elders. I said, no, my friend, you are wrong. <laughs> they were talking about the violence Bush was causing in that, state, in that country. I said, remember how you... you Bush was born and raised. What kind of an environment was that? Full of military toys, military guns. <laughs> and Bush started learning how to use those well. How to shoot at a person and kill. So he becomes the president. What good do you expect of him to share with the community of the United States? <laughs> so I'm trying to speak on behalf of children of the world on how we should heal them, help them heal themselves, help them become citizens of not my country anymore because they love to be citizens of our world. We are stopping them from doing exactly that, stopping them from achieving that noble objective of becoming citizens of the world because they no longer want to carry these passports across Mother Earth. It's one Earth, one world, one people. This is what we are teaching in the religions. This is exactly what we are teaching in schools, in universities, in science, one world. Which world are we talking about? 
It's Mother Earth that has no boundaries at all. You only see the boundaries on world map created by humanity because humans want to separate and then control. Finally, own everything and dictate. Another one. My friends, let us love the children. Give them much, much, much love, please. How do you give them much love? Take them into nature. Let them see nature. Because one day, if you take them to your church, they will begin to ask you some questions because they are very inquisitive. Mama, why are you worshipping? Who are you worshipping here? You say, I'm worshipping my ancestor. I'm worshipping my God, my creator. The child will go further and say, how can I see this creator? I want to see my creator. I want to see my ancestors. What are you going to show that child? Because you don't know who this God is. You don't even know who this great ancestor is, yourself. So you need healing. You need, there must be peacemaking here, <laughs> bringing these people together, like the Niagara Falls brings peoples of the world together, the Victoria Falls. It brings people to, of the world together. Become that Niagara Falls. Become that mighty Zambezi River. Become the Chobe River. Become the National Park of Chobe that refuses no creation. That's healing, that's peacemaking. How much healing have we done so far? <laughs> With the knowledge you all have acquired since your birth up to today. <laughs> yeah. Healing. Life and, and mind, this group, is powerful, it's amazing. Scientists who now begin to know and remember that we came from somewhere. In peacemaking, efforts, scientists have been carrying on, they finally discovered there was something missing in our peacemaking recipe. Exclusion of where we came from. <laughs> we were excluding all that stuff. Where we are and who we are, we are forgetting, we don't even know. That is why we say nature is out there. The universe is up there. <laughs> We are excluding ourselves from this recipe. It's not a complete recipe. But if we bring these recipes together, then we enjoy the peace, truth, love, justice, and harmony we talk about. Healing, we talk about. So what have you done as a healer? How much have you done as a peacemaker, as a medicine woman, Look at the other issue that spirits want us to look at as healers. Yes, it is. It is. You don't understand you, yourself. Who are you? What is the life purpose of your being on earth as a human being? If you ask the tree, it will tell you, is to give fruit to all creation. And the, the fruit tree will give fruit to all creation. It knows its purpose. It is performing. How about yourself? What is your, the purpose of your life of being on earth? If it is to cause conflict, division, inflict more wounds, humanity is number one. <laughs> we are number one in causing, inflicting wounds on ourselves, on our environment, on our other people. This is what is happening now. Okay. My purpose of being on this planet Earth is to share what I'm sharing with you, and I'm performing. If your purpose is to love, who do you love? What do you love? It all comes in Ubuntu and peacemaking, building a community, building a structure that connects 
weaken. Okay. A structure from this power we call creator, the protector, who protects us from negative spirits that wound us, that cause some of the challenges humanity is facing now. You go to the spirit, the ancestors. You go down to the spirit medium, whose duty it is to receive messages directly from ancestors on behalf of the people. And we come down to the, let's come to the land, for example. Land, our mother, our father. She is our mother, she is our father. The land, according to the indigenous knowledge and wisdom, land cannot be separated from people because people are the land. Land is the people. We are inseparable. Many bitter wars have been fought and are still being fought around the land issue because land, according to indigenous wisdom, is our burial place. Land is our medicine. Land is our food. Land is our shelter. So if you tamper with the land, you cause wars. That will be passed from generation to generation. That is why we had these freedom movements throughout Africa and throughout the world. Remember, there is not one single race or culture that has never been abused by another nation. We all carry that history of having been abused, controlled in one way or another. All of us on this planet Earth. But the new Ubuntu concept, the new healing, the new peacemaking is saying, yes, you cannot forget that history of yesterday. It is there, it is in people's blood. You cannot forget that. But spirits are saying, do not live in that yesterday history anymore. Write and bring in a new history that is going to be loved, that is going to be protected of, of your children in future. You are the future ancestors of tomorrow. If you leave this world in this chaos and hand it over to the young, young generation, then the world will never expect to, have, to experience peace whatsoever. But let us write a new story never sticking and living in the story of apartheid system, in the story of slavery, in the story of the uprisings, yes. Let's bring in a new story. This is what we are being asked to do by our dear brother, the Dalai Lama. He is talking in specifically about that. Baba Kredo Mutwa is talking exactly about it. Christ was talking about that. Buddha was talking about that. These were all messengers of peace and healing. Are we very intelligent students who can get it right? Or we are dunderheads who listen through this ear and then we let go of everything? Because we want to see the products, <laughs> the results of your, your, your struggles, the results of your studies, are you doing it well? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <My word>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mahondoro, uh, for that moving presentation you have put before us. Um, I just, uh, before I hand over to the respondent, just want to highlight the themes that I teased out, and I'm not going into details about that. The oneness of humanity and the oneness of humanity with nature. 
as well as the fact that Botu <coughs> is not exclusively embodied in particular individuals. I think those are very powerful messages. Thank you very much, Mondoro. I'm going to now ask, humbly, ask uh, the Reverend Mpo Tuvan Firth mm -hmm. to give us a few words in response to the presentation by Mondoro. Mm -hmm. Mondoro, thank you. Um, your, your presentation was so rich and so um, full uh, and touched on really the heart of what we are here for. Um, and so uh, if I was a slightly different you, I would blush to respond, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I was struck by a, a, a couple of things that you said um, in, in when, you, when you told your own story and you, you, you spoke of your um, resistance to your vocation, your resistance to the, the calling of your ancestors and um, you, you framed that in terms of um, an, an opposition between Christianity and the, the call <coughs> of your ancestors. Um, and from, yeah, from, from my learning and, and, and my understanding of Christianity, um, we've almost been held hostage to uh, uh, a Western, uh, a Western view of Christianity that atomizes us, that says, you know, the the spirit is is superior to the my to the to the body, and the um, the human body is superior to any animal body, and any animal body is superior to the earth and all of other things. And it, I think we've kind of taken in a profound misunderstanding of the charge given to humanity in, 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 the, book of, in the biblical book of Genesis where, where God says, I give you dominion over the earth. Um, but the my understanding of the dominion that God gives us is a dominion of stewardship, um, which is different from a, a dominion of domination. Um, it's a, a dominion of God saying, when I created you, I created you to be like me and to infuse um, in everything with which you come in contact, the same generous love and care um, that, that, that I, God, infuse in, in, in all of nature. And um, I think when we look back to what um, our Aboriginal people expressed in their lives and in their worship, there isn't, there isn't a division um, that to be truly expressive of what is holy is to recognize that we are always walking on holy ground. Um, where, wherever it is that our feet touch earth, we are touching that, that which God has created and that um, for which we have a burden and duty of care. So, uh, and that was only the first thing. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, but, and then the, 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 the second was, um, was, the, was on the thing of, of wisdom and, and knowing. Um, I, I was in, Hawaii, I'm just bragging. I was in Hawaii in, um, in July, but I was there to welcome um, the, the voyaging canoe, the Hokulea, 
back to Hawaii, and the, and the Hokulea is a Polynesian voyaging canoe. Um, it's about 60 meters long, um, and it had for three years traveled around the Earth, um, guided by, uh, navigated using only the stars, the winds, the currents, the land, the indigenous knowledge. And there's this really striking contrast um, between an in this incredible scientific knowledge that can develop a GPS <coughs> and shipping charts and um, you know, sort of figure out with incredible uh, technical accuracy the path that will get you from here to there. Um, and then you meet these Aboriginal people who have, in, in, for thousands of years, known how to get from here to there using a finger compass, knowing where the stars are, understanding how the winds and the currents um, move, and that that too um, is an incredible scientific knowledge, an incredible talent of observation um, that has been... <laughs> That that um, that that has has been disregarded, or dismissed, or forgotten, or set aside. Um, when when you speak of the gifts of healing, um, of knowledge of plants and their medicinal properties, um, that you know. It, it, there was a, 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 a time when the idea of, um, of divination and of um, healing by prayer and plant seemed uh, to be a, a, what do they call it? Um, there's an English word and English has just left me. Um, the, Yes, quackery, yes. So yeah, let's call it, yeah, it, was, it was described almost as quackery um, and dismissed as being untrue and not based in, um, in, in fact. Um, and yet now we have um, doctors from every stripe of knowledge saying, oh, well, let's see what medicinal properties those plants that you were telling us about have? And um, what, uh, how do we see the psychological well-being of communities who come together to pray for healing and well-being? Um, and that, that there, there is so much wisdom that we have let slip by the wayside um, that, that that you are pointing to us uh, to reclaim. Um, and that is Ubuntu Butu. That, that Ubuntu Butu takes into account um, all of the wisdom that world has to offer us. Because world does have the wisdom of healing and we need that wisdom, and for that wisdom, we must listen to world. Okay. Um, thank you very much for those comments. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up the floor up here to an interaction amongst the, the presenters that have not yet presented and the presentations that have already gone on. And um, this is the point at which I would like to bring back on the table Michael is his presentation this morning uh, and also the response by Jim Pa uh, and ask all of you up here 
for the sake of the audience up there, to really try and apply your minds to some of the things that have been said this morning in relation to how the African cosmology or cosmological uh, system and the indigenous knowledge that is embedded within it and that is uh, currently you know, the subject of a lot of what we are trying to do to dig up uh, this knowledge whether in terms of practice or in terms of academic uh, scholarship and so on and so forth, how it can all be brought uh, to bear on the question of how, you know, humanity can begin to confront some of the problems that it's facing today, uh, particularly also reflecting on current research that's going on in neuroscience. And so uh, I'm doing this because we have neuroscience researchers up here, as well as the uh, you know, Africanists and other and philosophers that would be qualified enough to, uh, to really talk to this issue. So with that, and you know, without calling anybody up in particular at, you know, as the first speaker, I want to open up the, the floor for that interaction. Any one of you that wants to jump uh, on the wagon end. <laughs> yes, I yes, I know. Yeah, I'm seeing that uh, um, in my eyes. Up there. I know. <laughs> well, um, you know what? There's a particular way in which this uh, situation that we have here is structured. Uh, the structure is that we give them the opportunity to uh, say what they need to say, and then maybe. If you know, hoping there will be time to allow a few uh, comments or questions from the floor because that would be true boto, right? It would be the true essence of boto, to also allow you to speak and not just have you here as if you have no thinking or no way of mm. <laughs> commenting. So I think we'll give them a chance. And if per chance maybe they're still thinking about it, I think I'm going to break protocol. Michael will forgive me to say if we have a question from the audience. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uri would like to speak first. Let me tell you who Uri is before he speaks um, so that you have that in mind. Uri Hassan grew up in Jerusalem. Uh, it's Uri Hassan. Hassan. As an undergraduate, he studied philosophy and cognitive sciences at the Hebrew University. He completed his PhD in neurobiology at the <coughs> Wiseman Institute in Israel and was a, a postdoctoral fellow at New York University before moving to Princeton. He is currently a professor in the psychology department and the Neuroscience Institute at Princeton University. His research program aims to understand the neural basis of face-to-face, brain-to-brain social interaction with a focus on verbal communication and storytelling in real life contexts. And before he speaks, I want to allay your fears because when he speaks tomorrow, it's not going to be a whole lot of jargon. He really brings it down to our level. <laughs> I'm speaking here as someone who is not a scientist. Uh, thank you, over thank to you, Ri. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm not going to, to talk now about what I'm going to talk tomorrow, I, but I have a question that bother me and maybe you can help me. You know, I was watching the news in the last days and I got really afraid of the dynamic that's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you talk, Mandeza, and also Michael in the morning about the need to listen and the need to accept the other. But we're coming now to the situation that the other suddenly is threatening us, right? And trying to take things that we believe for and fought for and take us back to a bad dynamic. And the question is, what do you do in this situation when the dynamic is changed and you want to be open and you feel that you progressed and suddenly someone take you back and say, no, we don't believe in all these values. We're going to bring back things that we think that were evil and we think that we won the war and suddenly we, f we feel that actually still there is another current over here and how do you deal with each other in this conflict situation.
and uh, it's open to any one of you to interject to. What is this question? Can you repeat the question? Kasim? Okay, let me say who you are. Yeah. No. Let me say who you are. No, no, no. I, no. I'm, I'm the one on the floor. Oh, Let okay, me say who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten Didrou is professor of psychology at Leiden University and is affiliated with the Center for Experimental Economics and Political Decision Making in the University of Amsterdam. He is a fellow of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences and former president of the European Association of Social Psychology. Um, he trained over 30 PhD students and 10 doc postdoctoral fellows, many of whom pursued successful academic careers. With them and others, he published over 200 research articles and 50 book chapters on the neurobiological and psychological underpinnings of human cooperation and conflict, ethnocentrism, intergroup prejudice, and discrimination, as well as creative problem solving as a means to negotiate agreement. He has published several books, including Conflict in Organizations uh, and Social Conflict Within and Between Groups. And that will be uh, the subject of what he will be speaking about tomorrow, some of what has been said here, some of what he has written about. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, well, thank you. Um, yes, I want to uh, perhaps add on or yeah, add a question on top of that, the one that Uri has posed. Um, and that is that the discussion on Ubuntu Boto has been very much, um, I would say, at the individual level mm -hmm. about I am through you. Mm -hmm. And many of the conflicts that we see, many of the problems that we mm -hmm. face today and in our history are problems between groups of people, where one group fights another group. And I was wondering, and I think, Michael, you touched on that towards the end of your presentation, to what extent and how you think that the concept of Ubuntu and the performative part of it especially can be applied to, say, intergroup relations where we, as a group, with an identity mm -hmm. and a culture exists because of the other group with a different culture, with a different identity. Mm -hmm. And whether we can use the philosophy of Ubuntu Otto, to understand or perhaps in regulate better the differences and the conflicts between groups. And I think this relates to what Uri is saying as well. So I, I'm really curious to, to see how you and okay. Andesa perhaps going to think about it. Here it is. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try, uh, well, suppose a conversation and questions are coming up, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to make sense of this and I'll try to link the two questions. And uh, Baba Mandaza <coughs> might have a tender for the wonderful speech. I enjoyed, thank mm -hmm. you so much for the education. Mm -hmm. um, the two things I stake here is um, what I didn't mention in my speech is um, when I talked about the essentialist movement of culture and performative movement of culture. You know, culture can be understood in different ways. Now, people can speak, even the white supremacists can speak of white supremacist culture. But when you go into ethnography and cultural anthropology or cultural history, we speak of uh, civic culture in the sense that it is it's movement, it moves out, it's not, uh, and then we talk about also ethnoculture, which is like, you know, it's closed system of values. People don't talk about it, it's just the same way, it's contained like a monad. We are the same, we have to be the same. And then Ubuntu, the one I suggest, we appreciate, is the performative one, and that is uh, it's open, it's civic, which means that uh, by its nature, Ubuntu is not static. Mm. It's a philosophy that engages with other philosophies, with other people, not just the human encounters, but also other indigenous system knowledge that you can gain, that, okay, in the past, maybe people practiced witch hunting in the name of Ubuntu, <coughs> and we encounter other cultures, say, no, it's not right, and then, because in its nature, it's dialogic, it mm. brings fresh knowledge system that we can appreciate. And I think, uh, the way out of this dilemma, because it's a very, very tough question, because uh, you want to have coffee with Donald Trump, yeah. and, but uh, Donald Trump doesn't want to have coffee with me. So mm -hmm. then what am I t 
to do then, because I say, hey, I want to have coffee with you, so I don't like you. I don't want to have coffee with you. So what do I do then in that? That is a, a very serious question. Do I give up when he doesn't want to have coffee with me then? So how do I keep making effort? And I think... Uh, but it's even more than coffee, right? He wants to take things from you, right? Yeah, he doesn't want to take things from me, exactly. Yeah. And I think what I would do, I would say keep making effort. That is performance aspect of it. It's, it's a way of life. I see making effort for him to have and have conversation with me to see me. I, I run away for me is not an option. I still try and engage him in that civic way, in the, in the, in the understanding that my own culture is civic is open and I want to appropriate, understand why he's doing it. And then understanding maybe one day it will rub off on him. But this is something very, very important because your question is also something that I, I want to think about. About We talk about uh, Ubuntu yet. We had things like um, genocide in Burundi and Rwanda. We have the people, other people, Makure Kure. It's that closed system that people who don't speak my language or who don't belong to the same ethnic group, they don't belong. And so that's, very, that's why I suggested that when we say I am because we are, there's a dark aspect of it because we recognize only our own kind. So as Baba Mandaza said, maybe it's our mindset. It's not just we, but the other people who are also different from us. So we move from that recognition that maybe it's only people from my ethnic group or who speak my language are the humans to recognize others who are not just like me, you know, who, are not, who don't look like me, not just the we, but the others, the enemy, the people I hate and stuff like that. And to be honest, I don't have a, a straightforward answer, yes or no to this, except that it's a reflection, it's, an art, it's culture, culture is a world of life, it's a lived experience, and then it evolves over time, and hopefully in a counter with other cultures, other cultures will also pick up from that, and then it keeps you know, touching other cultures, a touch of humanity, a touch of life. But you see, I'd like to add to that because I think the question then is, <laughs> I'm going to forget what I was going to say. No, yeah, let, let the... <coughs> they have no, no, the no, no, let's go. Let's they have, go. yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay. Fellow moderator. So, yes, I shouldn't be talking, but I can't help myself. <laughs> no, I want to add to that that I really do think it's the question of how you define I and how you define other. Mm -hmm. If we look at Ubuntu and we're looking, I am because you are, and the I and you are wider and more universal, taking us back to what you were saying, Jimpa, about the oneness of humanity, then the issue of the other becomes very different. I think we've moved into a world where somehow we have become so individualized that the other is anything that is not exactly like us. And then that means that group fighting, intergroup fighting, becomes so much easier. And it's not just in terms of intergroup fighting. It goes back to what Mandaza was saying about the environment and the ecology. We're not looking at the earth as part of us. We're looking at the earth as other. So we are, as Michael said earlier, cannibalizing the earth. So there's something for me, and this is why I'm really interested in the, the neuroscience of this, but also in the spiritual aspect of this, of how do we move back and how do we cultivate relationships in, era, in, in, in this new era which go back to Ubuntu being more collective than individual, when we live in an era where the individual is absolutely promoted and prioritized. And how do we move into an understanding that other is not necessarily bad, that other is not dangerous, that other doesn't mean we need to fight to establish a dominance of people or the earth or anything else that is just like us. And that that's the challenge of our times, but a challenge that I think an understanding of the oneness of humanity can help us begin to move towards. So, um, okay. Jim. what's happening right now, um, particularly in the US, um, it's a strange anomaly, because normally, as society becomes more secularized, less traditional, people tend to have less group identities. 
So one would expect less, less group conflicts. And that was in fact the kind of the story that was told by the secularists. You know, as societies become more enlightened, educated, scientific, people tend to have less group identity. And when there are less group identifications, there will be less group tensions. So what we are seeing in America right now is it's an interesting paradox. Because if this is the tail end of individualism, we wouldn't be expecting a kind of a group identity-based conflict. Mm. So it's a, it's a kind of a strange paradox. So I think here what we, what we need to learn from this is that regardless of where you ground your identity, the basis of your identity is an important issue. So whether it is religious-based identity, or whether it is culture-based identity, or whether it is race-based identity, for some reason, sometimes a particular group of people feel threatened. And that's when they choose a particular aspect of their basis of identity and take that as the defining feature of their group identity. And that's when things become complicated. So I think it's part of that has to do with I think social economic forces, because if we look at America, America was moving towards that direction for the last 22 decades. Even the political left stopped talking really about economic justice. You know, there was, I mean, it's like taxation as theft was one of the <coughs> great lines from one of the influential right wing philosophers. And that basic assumption that somehow taxation is theft seems to have been brought, brought over by even the left, political left. So once you don't cater for the need of the economically marginalized over a long period of time, you do end up in a situation where people say, hey, you know, we're being screwed. You know, this is an unfair system. The system is rigged against us, clearly. And then they start looking around, and when they see you know, people like themselves in the same situation. And there are strips of America where you drive through and you can see these are all industrial towns which looks really dilapidated, you know, run down. So you see, see this, this has been going on. So I think part of that has to do with negligence on the part of the community and society and the leadership and also the political rhetoric that has pushed in that direction. So I think it's a much more complicated. So I don't know whether something like the concept of inter interdependence or Ubuntu really has anything to offer in the immediate. Because these concepts in philosophy are there as a long-term solution. Because Ubuntu and the interdependence concept really talks about relational nature of who we are as individuals and the co-creative nature of our identity so that we don't lock ourselves in atomistic terms of us and them as self-enclosed two communities, or I and you as two self-enclosed discrete egos. And that kind of breaking down of that solidity requires quite a lot of, not just philosophical ideas, but the philosophical ideas need to be somehow embodied in political institutions. Mm -hmm. And this is why the concept of human rights was so powerful because it was institutionalized in the building of a whole society. So then people within that society expect to be treated. You know, human rights, respect for human rights then becomes a norm, not an aspiration. So we need something like that where the philosophical ideas need to somehow have a time to translate and shape the policy, education, philosophy, polity, and all of that. So this is a long-term yeah. process. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh. I think she was first. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's a follow-up. You want to follow up? No, I want to follow up. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. He says he's following up, but yeah, I don't it's know. It's okay. I offer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. After you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Jimpa, couldn't we then harmonize Ubuntu philosophy as that philosophical idea? that could be formatted and then given offered to them. Exactly. If we could have democracy here, can't we offer exactly. African political thought then? To the Western exactly. world say, America, look, this is Ubuntu. Why don't you try it at home? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I, yeah. yes, yes, right. I, I, I sort of want to agree with you, but I also sort of want mm -hmm. to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. I, I, because part of part of what <coughs> I I see is an incredible um, cynicism uh, that creates group mm -hmm. identity, that m you know that that creates a, an aggrieved we, um, and that aggrieved we gets uh, in race is a very easy way of con is that my earrings clicking <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice but this is not working oh. um sorry <laughs> um that 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 there is this incredible utility in creating an aggrieved we and race is such an easy marker for who gets to be aggrieved. Um, and you don't even need a whole lot of people of any given race to, um, to, to uh, create these huge fissures and fractures in community. And, um, and I think that 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 Ubuntu is not actually such a, a, a um, longitudinal philosophy that you have to kind of stretch all the way back there, and we'll only, you know, we're only going to get it ten years on, um, and and you know, be able to apply it and live it. Um, it it actually is is in the ability to rather offer a different vision of how we achieve that good end that, that we want to achieve. Um, you know, I mean, we, it's, it's really easy to stir people up and say, you know, oh, life is so terrible for you, and for many people it is terrible. Life is so terrible for you, and it's their fault. Um, rather than saying, life is so terrible for you, and this is how we are going to get from here to the good life that we all want to have. And that's the Ubuntu. Mm. And if I can yeah, just give a really Becca. practical example of that. Mm. Well, mm. I don't think we have to look so far back. Mm. I look at East and Southern Africa, and I look at the HIV AIDS crisis, and I saw women in villages, grandmothers, who had nothing. They didn't even own the ground that they were tilling, but they watched their children die, and they watched their neighbors' children die, mm -hmm. and they took on the grandchildren and the children of people they didn't know and the children in mm -hmm. other villages. Mm -hmm. There were some people who had 30 children they were looking mm -hmm. after, mm -hmm. and they had nothing. And for me, that was about Ubuntu. It was about saying that we will flourish as a community or as communities because we take responsibility for other human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think if it hadn't been for those grandmothers, East and Southern Africa would have perished under mm -hmm. HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Becca? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. So along some of these lines about how do we actually get these changes to happen, one of the things that stood out to me in Mandaza's talk was the idea of this imbalance between um, what, how we act based on you know, our brains and what we're seeing and we're not acting based on you know, what our hearts are, are telling us. And I think you know, one of the things that needs to happen is to kind of bring that balance back. And from a neuroscience perspective, I think that's why a lot of neuroscientists have become very interested in this concept of mindfulness and, mm -hmm. and how do you actually you know, sort of recalibrate your own um, thoughts and behaviors and actions and the way we treat other people, and I think that's something that um, if we do, uh, if we are able to to really understand that on a biological level, then we can learn to train our brains to see things differently and not to create these immediate kind of superficial ways of creating in groups and out groups that mm -hmm. aren't that aren't innate and in any way possible. So, mm -hmm. can I? Yeah, I. I really wonder about that. And the reason is that I think that 
people live in groups, we organize mm -hmm. ourselves in groups, mm -hmm. and not only because we feel uh, in an inequitable situation, we feel oppressed. We are born in a group, and we live, we grow, develop in groups. And the idea of oneness, I, I really find it fascinating, and at the same time, I think the oneness that we experience on the day-to-day -day basis is achieved most readily within the relatively closed group in which we operate, in which we work, in which we live, in our mm -hmm. small communities, villages, neighborhoods, organizations. And still we do get the most problematic encounters and conflicts between those groups, and, and oftentimes not. There are so many examples of where groups live peacefully together, exchange, trade, learn from each other, leave each other alone, and then for some reason sometimes they get into these very violent mm -hmm. encounters. And my question again is how can the philosophy of Ubuntu help sort of diffuse that or at least delay that tipping point where groups start to fight rather than talk. And, and I do not believe that we should think about this as a sort of long-term transformative philosophy. Because conflicts can have a long-term impact mm -hmm. for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see here in Africa, we see ha we've seen it in Europe. And I think what happens now in the US marks, again, generations. So I think we should indeed think about how it can help us now, here, mm -hmm. without giving up the idea of that people live in relatively small groups. We rely more on each other uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, <coughs> on our neighbors rather than on those on the other side of the ocean. So I think really I'm still very curious about how Ubuntu can help us in our day-to-day -day <coughs> practices. Yeah. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Mondoro, you want to come in on the conversation? One of my gifts, my dear friends, is um, I hear voices in my, my heart. And they want me to share what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Right now they are saying, you should be putting dialogue into practice right away. Because here, mm -hmm. We, we have so many listeners who should be actively participating in what we are talking about. Yeah. Let's in, include those people. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mondoro, for sharing that with you. There is one more comment. I'm going to try and find a Rove mic in the back. So, I? Yeah, if, if there is time. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I, I think that we're looking for a solution in a place that there is a dialectic tension. And in, when you have dialectic tension, <coughs> you should not converge to a solution. That's not going to happen. I think there are forces. I think, and when you, basically you think, you think about it like a yin and a yang. They go together and they compete. There is a dark side and there is a good side. We tend to be in group, and groups is, is a wonderful thing. Uh, women are different than men. Cultures are differences. Differences are good. I can be on one end as a scientist in this group. On the other end, he's coming from the Netherlands. I'm coming from Israel. Ooh. I'm living in the US. He's living in Europe. And it's good that we have differences and similarities <coughs> because then we can convert and also enrich. We want many, many opinions. On the other end, when you go to groups, when I say, you are different than I, then they can be also in conflict. And, and that's the nature of, of having many opinions and limited resources. The dynamics can also be bad. So there is a tension. You will not find a solution in Ubuntu or anywhere in the world that will solve this tension. This tension is something we need to live in. And sometimes the dynamic can be collaborative. And then these groups, multiple identities can come together, and sometimes they go into conflict. And then when there is a conflict, it's a different kind of dynamic. And 
And I wish <coughs> that we can always have this like positive dynamic. But I think this human nature of we and them will always also force us to go to conflicts. And, and I don't think Ubuntu or anyone in this room can have a solution in which the dynamic is always positive. And, and I wish we could find this way, but accepting this dialect and this tension can, can lead us to manage it better than to come with a topic solution in which everything is positive and we are all the same. Mm -hmm. Come back Thank tomorrow. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at this point, we are going to now allow questions, comments from the floor as we have been advised by Mondoro. It's not me breaking protocol. It is advice that he got. So it is on the basis of that that I've been saved from having broken protocol. Uh, there's, there's one over uh, there that maybe they can walk to. Oh, there's even one here. There's one here in, this, in the back. <laughs> Just tell us who you are first before you give us your commentary. I know you, but... Good afternoon. <laughs> Dimelang. 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 Um, my name is Didi, Didi Malang, Sokoko Bjorn. Um, I'm a co-founder of an organization called Afroboto. Um, in, in 2013, we started this organization after um, my very traumatic experience, having done my doctoral in clinical psychology in the US, I decided I wanted to come home and do my research here. And it was at the hands of my very own aunts, sisters, brothers, uncles, that I was hurt the most. Um, here I am, a young doctoral candidate, I'm ABD at this point, and I've come to do my research um, to offer to um, my country something that I thought was um, important. But anyways, to cut the, the story short, I received one, an email, and it was one, one sentence. The board met yesterday, and your request has been turned down. And it was this very sentence that took me into the deepest depression for me. Um, and it was, I'm sorry, there's so many things happening here at the same time and I'm hearing things, but I'm gonna share it. I was up this hill. When you leave this, this um, building today, just look up. And there's a hill right in front called Kale, because I lived at exactly two minutes from here, Kale Manor. I went up that hill, and I communed. I didn't know what was going on. Why didn't they want me to participate? I said, they. And right then, I separated myself from them. Yes. <laughs> and I wrote, um, Journals up that hill, journals I got to call safari of self, because I was journeying within. But um, not to bore you with my life story, I wanted to chip in to the, yeah. the questions that you posed of how do we do this. Um, I decided that I was going to do it by healing the healer, myself. Yes. Um, and it has been quite a journey, I'll tell you. Um, so we moved from here to Maung, and I now live in Maung, and we started an organization with my partner who's here somewhere, Mother Kay, um, and she's a mindfulness coach. I'm a clinical psychologist, but I wanna tell you something that might help all of this. When I got married in 99, I was really young, uh, my mother said to me, Didi, you're a Motswana child, Motoboto. 
When I went to the US, I joined the Red Cross. And I'll tell you, as a 25-year-old, I was down there in ground zero, doing the best that I could with the little that I could. I didn't have a PhD then. I was just a lay counselor providing psychological first aid. But what I have come to believe and know in my heart is that compassion really inoculates us from judgment. Yes. When we are able to look at those white supremacists and step into their shoes for just a little bit, it really might be where we should all be. Um, what does it take for somebody to feel like so, so, so passionate that I have to hold on to this and not allow anybody else in here? The same can be talked about tribalism. The same can be said about political parties and all of that stuff. But I truly believe that compassion is going to be the medicine that we all can employ, and it's free. <laughs> we don't have to pay for it. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, there is a mic there. Hey, it's not me. <clears throat> Hmm? I'll stand this side because I'm a little afraid of crowds. <laughs> uh, my name is Cheza Beba. I'm an industrial psychologist by nature. So my story is a little similar to hers. You go somewhere else, you learn well because the government sponsors you, and you come back and you want to give back to your country. So my I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Is we get so fixated on focusing on consensus as to what Ubuntu is, Ubuntu is, that you forget the principal core of it as to how to execute it. And you get so annoyed with researchers, like I researched this for my masters. From 1969 all the way till 2015, that's what the consensus, it's just, this one says this, no, I don't agree. This one says this, I don't agree. So my problem is, why do we have to focus on consensus as to not individualizing Ubuntu in different spheres? If it's clinical, what's Ubuntu in clinic? If it's medicine, what's Ubuntu in medicine? If it's this, then we might be able to move forward because if we keep trying to put a blanket approach to it, then I don't see us ever getting anywhere with this concept. So I don't know, I don't know if it's a question or if you could help guide with regards to this because for us researchers, especially young scholars, it becomes very difficult to follow a lead if we don't know how to silo this concept in different spheres. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Bangele, I think you can move to the mic. That's Professor Bangele Chilisa. Please move to the mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bagele Chilisa from the University of Botswana. First of all, I want to thank Muhondora Mandaza for the uh, beautiful presentation, the insights, the vision of where we should be going. And in particular, I want to thank him for letting us know that Ubuntu has been discussed by many, many scholars. We are very happy that Mind and Life Institute has for the first time taken up the, the concept of Ubuntu. Yes. Many other organizations have gone into the discussion of Ubuntu. <laughs> I also want to thank him for reminding us that there are many versions of Ubuntu. And I want to stand here and say that my version of Ubuntu is grounded in my culture, in the way of life of my people. For me, motoke motokabatu. For me, it means I am because we are. And when Mbiti said I am because we are, he said that he wanted us to realize that 
We are talking about relationships here. We are talking about connections. We are not only connected to other people, but we are also connected to animals, to nature, to the environment. So when we say we, we include spirituality because we are also connected to our ancestors. Therefore, we cannot talk about conflict between people, between communities, without talking about the environment, without talking about the struggle for the limited resources, without talking about poverty. If you do that, then it, it, becomes, it, it becomes a very fake. That's why I say, yes, you can talk about Ubuntu as I am because you are, but I prefer I am because we are, because it reminds us of the many, many, many relationships that we need to create, the connections that should be there, the nature that should be there. And the moment you remove spirituality, which is part of the we, then you are also removing the environment. Then you forget that this conflict is not in isolation. It's about the struggle for the limited resources. It's about the environment. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, <coughs> Elisa. Um, I have to, uh, how many more? Yes, it is. But with so many people going in the eyes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sanya. And uh, my question is specifically to <coughs> Tata Mandaza. How do you learn to listen with your heart? How do you learn to listen with your heart? <laughs> with, it. with your heart. Thank you. Um, do, 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 do you want us to take like three in a row, maybe? Another three. Or oh, it should be responded to. There because I'm trying to coordinate with somebody with a mic who's continuing to. Okay, let's have the response, then they will come up and yeah, they can respond. Oh. It is said by the wisdom keepers, it is only the wise person who says, I don't know. <laughs> if you are always full of, I know everything, you are unknowing everything. <laughs> If you follow that spirit that talks to you in your head first, then it goes through your heart carefully with faith and with no doubt. Some people will say, I want to go and try it and see if it works. You are trying spirit. Spirit will never respond to your request. But if I say, I am going to ask for guidance from my ancestors, from my creator, I want to see how I can listen with the ear of my heart. It's going to happen. <laughs> Mark my words. It's very important. Very, very important indeed. So it is learning to listen learning to listen after having asked for guidance from whatever source you worship, you respect in your life. Because there is no one religion that is more important than another religion. There is no one God, so to speak, who is more important than other gods. <laughs> gods because we have got human-made gods. Some people have ma made money into a god. 
they cannot survive without money. Other people have made, for example, look at how the word Ubuntu is abused, and it has been made into a little god that can invite more people who are going to, if you, because you are, therefore I am you. <laughs> That's kind of a god. If you are, then I am like you. There is danger there. We are talking about listening to your heart. Look at this guy. He has a, an outlet of drug taking. In the city center, alcohol outlet, he gives it a name. What name do you find there? Ubuntu restaurant. <laughs> Ubuntu club. <laughs> That is the abuse of that word. How can such a person really listen to the heart which says, do not do this? Ubuntu <laughs> is, 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 when you want to learn Ubuntu, you learn by watching, not by listening to the stories about Ubuntu. Visit a community where Ubuntu lives. Just watch, just be there and behold. You begin to understand when we talk of Ubuntu according to our indigenous wisdom. Just be there where Ubuntu has been in existence. I don't think you'll ever want to take notes about what you are going to see. Just be there and behold. Your heart will take it in now. That's a, just one example I can give you, okay, about listening with my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, are you done? Are you done? Mm -hmm. I've finished. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, I was going to ask you, Mohondoro, <coughs> uh, to, if you don't mind, no, I don't. Uh, respond briefly, as briefly as you can, mm -hmm. to Dr. Didi's um, very profound testimony because I'm saying that because it reminds me of something that I think maybe you didn't get a chance to elaborate. Okay, dear. You said something to us when we were preparing uh -huh. that Women. Uh, only someone who has had what emotional whatever, trauma or something can truly be a healer, something like that. Oh, okay. So what she said seems to resonate with that sentiment that you expressed at the time, and it was in relation to your own experience. So if you can briefly. If Today we have um, a story that is hitting human community, the story of gender. It is quite a very disturbing issue the story of gender. Women claiming that they want to regain their God-given gift of leadership. That has been taken away from them by men, <laughs> M-E-N. For various reasons. Ah. Women being abused. <laughs> Who is a woman? We refer to the earth as mother, mother earth. Do we truly understand who mother earth is? She is the woman. We have excluded from all human activities for centuries and centuries. And the woman has been watching and uh, saying, let's see where these men will take us to. I'm speaking on my own personal experience here. I've gone through apartheid system myself. I'm a product of apartheid in, in Zimbabwe. It was terrible. It is the very way we are treating the women of the world. <laughs> when we hear of any country or government that says, this time around we want to have the woman as the president, 
It's a window dressing. There is no truth in that statement. They are hidden agendas. <laughs> like the time when Christianity and other religions were introduced in all parts of the world. There was goodness in, every, in that religion. Goodness, spirit of development, spirit of togetherness. Were they saying the truth? <laughs> Let us look at this word. I'm still, English is my second language. I'm learning English. So please forgive me for, you know, abusing it. <laughs> Not intentionally, really. My dear friends, let us look at this word, woman. I think it's a word that has two meanings for me. <laughs> for me, I was asking spirits, who is woman? They said, man, does look at this. Who me represents fem female? Man is male. So you cannot separate this word, woman from itself. Humanity has been doing it to separate it <laughs> on purpose. But you cannot hide the truth forever. The truth someday will show up itself like it is now. It is the woman who gives birth, the, the two, the, the the female and the male. She says, if you want to look at me and know me, this is the great power of creation, just look at my creation. So if I look at this woman sitting in front of me right here, I must see myself in her, being a male in her. When she looks at me, she has to see herself in me as a woman. We are one. Nothing can live in isolation. Okay. Thank you. Women are made to believe that they are minor citizens of the world. It has been a teaching that has been passed from generation to generation. If you read the history of Africa, written by the pioneers, not by the black people of that time, they say women were given these roles and men were given these roles. By who? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I love to share stories, my dear friends. When I work with people, I don't want time. <laughs> okay, uh, we see, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. My take here is as an educator, and I know there are many, many professors in this room, really, and I'm sure you'll think of Boto Ubuntu as a personal practice or as a group practice. You brought the group dynamics into it. It is a reflective practice at the end of the day for the individual. They have to think it through. But look at how busy everything has become. I mean, I know with us as a young university, we, we set out a Boto graduate profile, which we said is what we would like to take to our students, you know. But when we started looking at the elements of it, it has gone through two changes. We find that what happens in the classroom is but a minor <coughs> part of it. And all the rest needs to happen in their life, which is outside in the classroom. But that life has become so busy because education now is a race to accumulate knowledge. For what? I'm taking the question from you because you asked many for what questions. Yes. But we sometimes in that race, we have forgotten to put space for reflection. Be it at school level, be it at college level, be it later on as as practitioners, I think we just don't give ourselves that space. So maybe a solution to use Boto for conflict mm -hmm. is to, it will be long term like Jimpa said, exactly. but is to try and bring reflective <coughs> elements back into education. 
and create space for that. Mm -hmm. And the problem is somebody is going to have to pay for it. <laughs> so that will be where the problem will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we could take two more, three more, I don't know. Thank <coughs> you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, sorry. I was given the mic as oh, in case apparently, you must speak. Okay. Yeah, okay. Rasigwani. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, the uh, moderator. And also, I want to, to thank, uh, is it Mike? Yeah. Yes, sir. And also, my homeboy here. <laughs> <laughs> my village is next to Francis Town, which is next to Plum Tree. <laughs> I could walk across and use the local language and communicate with Papa. the friend of mine here. <laughs> I've appreciated your, your understanding of Bhutu. Okay. But because of my training in the science of the mind, where I was trained that the only source of creation on earth is your mind, Anything that you do, it emanates from your mind. Anything that you do is generated by the state of your thoughts that are in your mind. So I haven't studied a lot of books that have written about Ubuntu. But I take it that Ubuntu is an ability, it's an inner value. All abilities are generated by the mind. Where we come from, we are saying, the state of your mind determines the, the, the type of value you have. The state or the size of your thought capacity can magnify the power of Ubuntu than when your mind is smaller. What, what I'd like to say just here, just briefly, is that the mind is the creator of everything. You can only create, it can create two things. Pleasant activities that you desire. Uh, when that is the case, you'll be able to create more of the things that you need on earth and less of the things that you do not need. That is when your mind is positive. A positive mind inside it are positive thoughts, positive emotions, positive beliefs, positive actions. In this case now, you are more powerful than ever. A positive mind will be able to, to ensure that when you are a professor, whatever subject you have studied is buttressed. The mind that is positive now is foundational to those to, to, to those uh, subjects that you have passed. In other words, the mind can only be positive when you have studied software subjects. Software subjects. And then when the mind is negative, when the yeah. mind is negative, it's going to reduce, it's going to reduce whatever knowledge you have so that in the end you create less of what you want um, and more what you do not want. I, I don't want to interrupt yes. uh, Resigwane, so, but uh, we're so almost at the end of the day. Uh, I understand oh, why okay. there is that reaction. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Resigwane, very much. Um, um, <coughs> we, 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 are, we are beginning to hear from our practitioners, our community builders, so um, it's good because we are beginning to look ahead exactly. of where uh, we are going. So it's not just a dialogue for the sake of yeah. it, but that there is some way in which it can be put into practice. So we value that. Good. Thank you. I uh, think maybe we should decide on how many more questions. Daniel, help me. Two more yeah. questions? Yeah. Maybe. Huh? Okay. Three, four, five, six. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> um, Dumela? We don't have to respond. <laughs> Dumela Mbaholo, my name is Mother K. Masire. I'm a co-founder of Afrobutu with Dr. Didi there. 
and I use the word dumelang. In Setswana, that's how we greet each other. And when you looked at the meaning, it means I acknowledge you. You know, when you meet somebody, I acknowledge that you're a person. I think that is very powerful. So um, with my own understanding, I've sat with the word buto, and I was wondering what really it is. And from, you know, all the communing with the word, I'm thinking, get into what you're saying. Um, it's not a theory. It's something that all human beings are born with. You know, when you look at a child, when they are born, they, they are accepting, they are embracing, they want to share, but we get to learn other things. So for me, Boto is about remembering who we are as human beings. So if we sit still, that is what mindfulness really teaches us, to go within. And I like saying, if we don't go within, you go without. So we shouldn't take this as a subject of external, but just sit down and go within and remember who we are as human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one minute left, and we'll have to decide um, how to I use just, it. Excuse me. A I just person. wanted to make a quick comment. Who is speaking? I'm all the way at the back. I don't know. Hi. 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 I'm at the back here. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Akhil Malusi, and um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I wanted to personally express my gratitude to Mr. Mandaza for his beautiful speech and for being the only person today to highlight the power of the youth and the essentiality of bringing children into a peaceful world. And sir, <laughs> and you know what? Let me tell you something, okay? We might have gotten the cheapest tickets, therefore we're at the back because I've been standing here for 20 minutes with my hands like this. But I just wanted to let you all know, all of the adults in this room, that we are here and we are listening and we want to know and learn from you. We want to learn from the generation above us, but you need to give us the voice to do oh, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well spoken. Yeah. One, last, question, please. one last comment. Oh, yeah. uh, That's good. With all due respect, one last comment and keep it short, please. Um, I wanted to try answer Dr. Karsten. Did I see it right? This question okay. about the practicality of Ubuntu in the modern world, and that is a very good question actually, because Ubuntu, um, as someone mentioned, it's it's intuitive. It's not a theory. It's not a concept. It's not a schematic that we're taking and we're saying we're going to try implement it. It's, it's intuitive, it's from the heart. Um, there are certain morals that we cannot teach that come along with that, like good, I mean wrong and right, that is part of Botu. It's all part of humanity, the respect for human life, um, the respect for hu other people's privacy, and it's, it's, it's all part of Botu. And with that said though, it is, as you mentioned, I, I'm not going to say go as far as say outdated, but we have to understand that it is, it ha, it is an aged um, philosophy, and how, as, as all philosophies they evolve, it's still there today. Both who is in everyone, it's in, in it's, I don't, I wouldn't say it's strictly something African. It's as long as you are a human, you have that both who inside of you. And um, to to reference um, Jenpa, he said all reality exists as part of, um, do you say comparisons or, or? Relationships. Relationships, thank you. And basically what that means, um, even if you look at the field of science, observation and, and experimentation, we compare things. I am because you, ca you are. You cannot describe something absolutely. You will say it's, 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 it's red, but then in strictly speaking in physics, red is only relative to um, a part of the spectra of light and something like that. Everything is just one big part of, of, of there's no individuality and that's part of Boto, the understanding that you do not exist as a separate ego. And I think that's the fundamental philosophy of Buddhism as well, which, which um, I'm, 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 I'm quite interested in. And I, I hope that answered your, your question. Hey, we say the one who has the last word is 
king. Oh, of course. <laughs> so, and I really want to state it for the record that we really value our young people. And I think it could be unfortunate that we're not seeing their hands, or I wasn't, because of where I'm sitting, I don't know. But we really value them, and we value their input. And in that respect, we actually do have representation. When uh, Bob Mandazo was saying earlier on, like, where is, our, where is the youth, or where are our young people? I had wished to state that we actually did recognize the need to include them. And we, we had originally invited two youth, African youth. Uh, one, Grace Amponsa, was supposed to be here from Ghana, but unfortunately uh, didn't get a visa. And we do have Donald Molusi, who's going to be the sole representative for youth. But you know, we are getting there. You know, we old people are slow, but we are getting there. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll include more and more of you in the future. Thank and you. especially that the dialogue has come here. Thank you. And we'll obviously come back because the president said, he would still <laughs> like the HADL to come here when he's well, and you all to come back. So we'll have more young people then as well. Thank you.